Well, thank you for braving the rain and the weather. This is why I don't live in Minnesota. <laughs> Thanks for having me. I really appreciate the University of Minnesota YAF for having me. Hopefully, unlike the last two nights at DePaul and University of Wisconsin, people can control themselves. I won't be threatened with arrest or shouted down, which actually was my last two nights. Uh, and, uh, you know, discussion. For, uh, the way that this is going to work is when we actually get to the Q&A, if you are somebody on the left, we want you to actually have a chance to converse. So we'll get, we'll get to you first when we get to the Q&A. Uh, you have priority. Um, but if you're too upset to ask questions, I understand that, too. It's been a very upsetting two weeks for folks on the left now that Lightbringer Hillary has finally gone down and uh, Donald Trump is uh, up in the Tower of Orange Power as the president-elect <laughs> of the United States. And, uh, and for the, I, I don't know if they've been doing it at this campus. I know they've been doing it at a lot of campuses. Uh, a lot of the people who are on the left have been wearing these safety pins around to, to show all of their colleagues that they are not these racist, sexist, bigot, homophobe Trump supporters. Uh, and uh, I thought in, if there were leftists in the audience who needed them, I brought some extras. I brought some extra safety pins for you. Uh, and I also brought the diaper that goes with them. <laughs> Almost ran out of those the last couple of days. So. <laughs> so today I want to talk to you about the battle that you face regarding free speech. And then I want to talk to you about why you are going to fix the country. Your generation, my generation, we're going to fix the country together. Because God knows that your parents and grandparents really, really screwed the pooch. And so did the professors at most major universities. And so did a lot of your fellow students. So most Americans on campus really don't have a clue why freedom itself matters. Why it's an important thing. Freedom to them is actually sort of an inconvenience. They're more interested in feeling good about themselves than about learning new ideas or contemplating new arguments, all of which is actually a fair bit of work. To make themselves feel good, a lot of folks on the left have to have power, power over other people. And the way that they achieve power is by converting the students to the religion of feelings. Feelings are the left's chief way of quashing free speech. Too many people on the left believe the notion that if you claim you've been victimized, that means you get to shut everybody else up. The worse you feel, the more you get to use your power to quash other people. You know, President Obama says this about race relations in the police. Never mind the statistics. The only thing that matters is that some Americans feel put upon by the police. You don't actually have to show that the police are racist. All you have to do is feel that the police are racist, and then it is incumbent upon the police to change their behavior. And that means that everybody has to change based on feelings, not substantiated feelings, not justified feelings, just feelings. So President Obama, when he was in Dallas taking advantage of the mass murder of cops, he actually was at their memorial service and he said this, said, quote, in the end, it's not about finding policies that work. It's about forging consensus and fighting cynicism and finding the will to make change. Right, okay, if politics, if politics is not about finding policies that work, then what in the world is it about? Well, for the left, politics is not about finding solutions. It's about justifying feelings. And that's why the Supreme Court ruled that same-sex marriage was a constitutional right because the government had to confer dignity. This is actually in the decision, right? The government had to confer dignity on same-sex couples. But that's not the government's job. It's your job as a human being to act in a way that earns dignity from friends and from neighbors and from God. When I got married, I didn't look to the government to confer dignity upon, dignity upon me and my wife. The idea was supposed to be that I was deserving of dignity from her because I treated her well and the same for her, and we earn dignity from our community by treating each other well and providing a home for our children. You earn dignity. It's not conferred just by some great God government that hands it down from on high. It's not government's job to confer dignity because government isn't your friend or your neighbor, and it is certainly not God. But the left tends to think that your government is these things because they are victims, and they have to have power to make themselves feel better, and they can't control godly power. They can't really control what people think of them, but they can control the government. The great God of government can control dignity. It can guarantee them dignity. And it can also withhold dignity from people who commit the ultimate blasphemy of saying, no, I am not going to bow down to this altar of government. And if you say no, if you're one of those people who says that you're not going to bow down to that altar, you become a thought criminal. And they've convicted you on campus of being a thought criminal because they believe that you have the means and the motive and the opportunity to commit the ultimate thought crime, not caving to their feelings. This is a thought crime, and you're a thought criminal. You are guilty. And again, means, motive, and opportunity. You have the means, first of all, because the means of not caring about their feelings is believing in facts more than you care about anybody's subjective feelings. Free speech has to be quashed, the left believes, if you refuse to abide by their rules. And they really have only one rule in the end, and that is no facts. Because facts are objectively not their feelings, right? Facts are something else. Facts are racist. Facts are sexist. Facts are mean and nasty and cruel because there's no way to reject facts 
for their implicit bias or for their white privilege or for their microaggressions. The left can reject you as a person, and they will, but they can't reject facts. Facts have a funny way of forcing people to listen. They're inconvenient, and therefore they're pernicious. Because the left's worldview is based on feelings, it's based on feeling good about themselves, the left isn't concerned really even with material equality so much as they're concerned with equality of feeling. They're threatened by facts. They've been taught by the government and their politicians that freedom isn't just doing what they want and then bearing the consequences of their actions. Freedom is doing what they want and, for and forcing other people to bear the consequences of their actions because that makes them feel better, right? It, it's hard. If you have to bear the consequences of your own bad decisions, that might make you feel crappy. But it makes you feel better if you do bad things and then other people have to deal with that. It's everybody's job to pay your tuition. It's everybody's job to guarantee you a salary commensurate with your education. In reality, by the way, most college students, when they get out, are making a salary commensurate with their education, which is zero. Right? Okay, the fact is that most of the things that you need to know in a real job, you learn on the job, by working a job. Okay, when I graduated from Harvard Law School, I was not qualified to be a lawyer. I was qualified to be a lawyer after I worked as a lawyer for a year, right? It's everybody else's job, though, to make them feel good about themselves. That is the most important thing. Everybody has to adjust them. Everybody has to adjust to them. But here's the thing. You really don't have an obligation to care about their feelings, and this is the kryptonite for the left leftist Superman. If you don't care about their feelings, they have no comeback because reality doesn't care about their feelings, and as I like to say, facts don't care about their feelings. So the left moves to quash all these facts with everything up to and including violence. Even the invocation of fact makes them upset. This is the philosophy of microaggressions they get on campuses like this one. Facts are microaggressions. Hell, even questions are microaggressions. So, for example, University of Minnesota just gave librarians a 36-page identifying and responding to microaggressions PowerPoint training. I thought in a library the only microaggression was talking loudly, but apparently not. <laughs> According to the materials, librarians are supposed to correct students on their microaggressions. These include saying things like, where are you from? This is a micro uh, microaggression because it makes you subjectively feel bad for some reason, which is weird. I guess, that, I guess if you say, where are you from, you're implying that the person is not from here, which I know, I know you weren't born like right here. Where are you from? Right? But it's a microaggression, and it might make somebody feel bad. Or if you ask an Asian person for help with math, that apparently is a microaggression. So you have to specifically not ask the most intelligent Asian student in the class. You have to go to the person who's next to them, right? Because if you ask an Asian for help with math, it's like asking a Jew for help with accounting. <laughs> if you say that a qualified person should get a job, this apparently is a microaggression. The most qualified person should get a job because who knows? You might be offending the least qualified person in the room. They might feel offended. By the way, if you feel like you're the least qualified person in the room, there's a very good shot that you are, and you shouldn't be offended by anybody saying so. Or if you say, this is actually directly from their, their little manual, if you say men and women have equal opportunities for achievement, this is a microaggression too, because it's subjectively offensive. Except for the fact, of course, that women do have an equal opportunity for achievement, which is why in Time Magazine 2010, the 50 large, 47 of the 50 largest cities across the United States, women with equal education, time in the workforce, and no babies, they have exactly, not only exactly the same income, they actually have significantly higher income than men. Women out earn men. Women are the majority of people who are going to college in the United States. Women are now the majority of law students in the United States. Women are about half of medical students in the United States. Okay, women have plenty of opportunities in the United States, but if you say that, it's a microaggression because someone feels bad, and facts make people feel bad. There are even macro-level microaggressions, like around here, they, really, they say this, a macro-level microaggression is that all of the buildings around here are named after white heterosexual upper-class males. Okay, have you been to Minnesota lately? <laughs> and they're right, I guess we should just name all the buildings after RuPaul, just because. <laughs> and, and the thing is that, you know, these microaggression, this language of microaggression, it comes along with the idea that if you violate somebody's feelings, that they are able to be aggressive with you. They're supposed to be aggressive with you in response, right? Microaggressions, it's not just something I say that offends you, it's that you now get to get violent with me, right? That's what the language implies. I'm aggressing you, therefore you get to be aggressive with me in return, right? Aggression is met with aggression. And this is bled up into the upper echelons of the left. Any sort of factual conversation, anything that you say that can be taken subjectively in an offensive way, that justifies violence. So my personal experience with this comes courtesy of CNN Headline News. I don't know how many of you have ever seen CNN Headline News. Show of hands. Who's seen CNN Headline News? Great. That's the entire audience for CNN Headline News. Uh, CNN Headline News has no ratings, like none. Uh, and, uh, and they asked me, CNN Headline News, about a year and a half ago, they asked me to, uh, to come on to discuss Caitlyn Jenner. This is right when Caitlyn Jenner's story was breaking, and ESPN wanted to give Caitlyn Jenner the Hero of the Year Award. And my perspective, just 
preliminarily, my perspective on, on transgenderism is that transgenderism is a tragic, horrible mental illness, and that people who suffer from it should be treated with nothing but sympathy, and that the idea that you can magically change a man into a woman or a woman into a man is anti-biology and anti-fact and foolish, and actually is encouraging delusion uh, and does not help anybody. And this comes as somebody who's had severe mental illness in the family, trying to humor the, de the delusions of people who are mentally ill doesn't do them any favors. And the fact is that transgender surgery doesn't do anything to lower the suicide rate. It doesn't, it's 40% before, it's 40% after. There's something that has to be done to help people, but it is not to pretend that sex doesn't exist, that men and women are, are not real, that, that you can just randomly change. That's my perspective on this. So CNN Headline News is doing this, this segment on, uh, on Caitlyn Jenner, and they looked up conservative in the white pages because they, you can do this in, in Los Angeles. And, uh, and my name was the only one. And so I was the only conservative in a 30-mile radius of CNN headquarters uh, on Sunset Boulevard. And so they say, can you come in and do Dr. Drew's show about this? Okay, sure. So I come in, and I get in the green room, and the producer comes up to me, and he says, you know, we here at CNN Headline News have no ratings. And I said, yes, I'm aware. And, and he says, so we want to have a spicy conversation. We want to do something that's a little bit different. We'll have a spicy conversation. By the way, I used to produce for Jerry Springer. And it was at this point that I should have thought, this is not good. But being the intrepid sort, I decided to, to stick around. And they put me on set, and we sit down, and it's me and then three people to my right, all to the left, and then people in front of me is Dr. Drew and a couple of folks on the stage. They are also leftists. So it's me against six leftists, which makes it almost fair for them. So... <laughs> <laughs> And the debate begins. So the entire debate is, the, the entire debate is, is Caitlyn Jenner a hero or the greatest hero? Is Caitlyn Jenner, should, should Caitlyn Jenner be given an honorary medal of honor or should Caitlyn Jenner be granted an honorary spot in Arlington National Cemetery when he dies? Should Caitlyn Jenner be somebody who is, is actually made Pope or should Caitlyn Jenner be built a golden magic chariot to take him to the sky just like Elijah, right? This was, the, this was the tenor of the debate. And then finally, Dr. Drew comes to me, and he says, do you think that Caitlyn Jenner deserves, how heroic do you think that Caitlyn Jenner is, you know, on a scale of 10 to a bajillion? And, and I said, I really don't understand what's heroic about this at all. This is really tragic. You're, so you're looking at somebody who, in profiles of him, explicitly said that he would undergo surgery and he'd come back and cry because he'd look at his face and realize what he was doing to himself, and then he'd have to call mental health specialists to come in and convince him that what he was doing was right and okay. This is not something that, that is wonderful to be celebrated. I don't understand why society is humoring mass delusion. And, the, and uh, I neglected to mention one part of the story. Uh, the person sitting next to me was a transgender person. Uh, and the person sitting next to me was a, was a person named Zoe Turr. So Zoe uh, used to be Bob Turr, and Zoe uh, was not happy with what I was saying. So Zoe turns to me and says, you don't know anything about biology, little boy. Uh, he growls at me in a voice an octave lower than my own. And... <laughs> and and I said, well, I do know that every cell in Caitlyn Jenner's body contains a Y chromosome, with, ironically, the exception of some of Caitlyn Jenner's sperm cells. And he, he keeps going, you know, you don't know anything about biology, little boy. You don't know anything about genetics, little boy. And after, you know, kind of pushing me for a couple of minutes, just saying the same thing over and over, you don't know anything about genetics, little boy, I finally turned to him and I said, well, what are your genetics, sir? And it was the sir that set him off. He reaches over, this is live on national television, he reaches over, and he grabs me by the back of the neck on national TV, and he says, if you don't cut that out, I'll send you home in an ambulance. And honest to God, my first thought was, that doesn't even make sense. You don't go home in an ambulance. <laughs> but but, what, but what, I, what I said was, but what I said was, that seems mildly inappropriate for a political conversation. Well, the point of the story is that everybody on the panel, all the six people on the panel, all left, they, they, none of them say to, to Zoe, Zoe, that's completely inappropriate. Take your hands off. A, you can't commit assault and battery on the set of a national television show on live TV. That's probably bad policy. Instead it was, Ben, how could you possibly say that to Zoe? You knew you would offend Zoe. And this was the whole point, right? The setup is, would anybody be willing to offend Zoe Turt, right? That was, that, that was what this whole thing was, because the left has to play identity politics. They don't want to have an open, honest conversation about transgenderism. Instead, they want to make it so that you have to insult someone and hurt their feelings and look like a jerk, right? That was the whole point. So the idea was, because I had said sir, which is what I typically say to men, right, then this, then, which was the entire debate, then I, I deserve to be treated with violence. That was, that was the basic idea here. And by the way, the threats of violence didn't stop afterward, even as the left was talking about how terrible I was. 
right after this, Zoe, hulking out of the room, turns to me and says, I'll see you in the parking lot. And, <laughs> and uh, the security had to escort me out to my car after one more segment. And then later, Zoe goes on, on Twitter uh, and threatens to curb stomp me, all of which I thought was deeply unladylike behavior. <laughs> but once you, you know, for, for, so for the left, the idea anyway is that if you speak facts, then this is, a, this, is a ringing, this is a ringing endorsement of your own evil, right? This just shows that you have the means to deny them what they want, which is you to feel bad about yourself. That's what the left, that's how the left gets people, right? The left tells you you're a bad person if you're not with them, and then you feel better about yourself if you, if you sort of surrender and say, yes, I'm with you, sure, mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. Okay? As a thought criminal, they also have to declare that you have a motive, right? And you do have a motive. Your motive is that you believe in individualism. Individualism is bad, right? Individualism is judgmental. Because the thing about individualism is it suggests that some things you do are better than other things, right? It suggests that some actions are smart and some actions are stupid. And this makes you hateful. This makes you judgmental. Individualism means that we will never achieve equality of outcome because some people are going to make better decisions than others. And that's racist and sexist and bigoted, we know, because that means that just by dint of statistics, certain groups will probably underperform other groups. If it turns out that one group of people with one skin color doesn't do as well as another group of people with a different skin color, the left believes that fairness of outcome has not been achieved, right? Individualism has gotten in the way of fairness of outcome, which is their highest priority when it comes to government. And that means that if fairness of outcome hasn't been achieved, somebody's a victim. Somebody has to be a victim. If you want to know anything about the left, it's just look for the victim, right? They're, they're constantly looking for the victim. It means that the underachieving person can't have made bad decisions. They don't like individualism. The underachieving person hasn't made a bad decision. The underachieving person has been victimized by society because of their identity. Right? The left believes that freedom and liberty in America, the philosophy of individualism, it's insufficient. If it were sufficient, we'd all end up in exactly the same place. We don't. Inequality is inequity. Right? This is why the left focuses so much on income inequality. Right? In the real world, I don't care about income inequality. I care about there being a lot of poor people. I would like those poor people to be richer. But the left cares about income inequality, which suggests that the people on the top have stolen from the people on the bottom, which doesn't make any sense. The people on the bottom don't have anything, gang. Right? If you want to get rich, you don't steal from all the poor people. Right? So the fact is that income inequality doesn't mean anything, but for the left it means everything. Because when they talk about income inequality, what they really mean is that poor people have been put upon by the system. The system has been cruel to these people. So if you're for individualism, according to the left, that means that your motive is to hurt other people. Free speech, which is just individualism and thinking, that hurts other people, so it must be stopped. And symbols of free speech have to be stopped too, since they're really just a ruse designed to mask America's evil. The flag has to be stopped. It's just a ruse, right? It's all designed to mask America's evil and the fact that it's a discriminatory system. The national anthem is bad. You have to protest it because the national anthem says that it's a free country and you've got to do what you've got to do and then bear the consequences of that. That's why last year the Minnesota Student Association voted not to participate in a 9-11 memorial because the unity against terrorism and in favor of America would hamper any effort to point out that America is deeply and horribly Islamophobic, right? If, you, if we all surround 9-11 and we say we're going to do a memorial to 9-11, that suggests there's such a thing as bad, right? And they're, they're afraid of that. It says that America is a good country that's full of freedom, and we pay tribute to that. But that's bad because America isn't full of freedom. America is a bad country full of discrimination. The MSA Director of Diversity and Inclusion, David al professional useless person, he said, the, he said, the passing of this resolution in favor of a 9-11 memorial might make a space that is unsafe for students. Islamophobia and racism fueled through that are alive and well. Right? Just because so you hold a memorial for 9-11 and this means that you are an Islamophobe and a racist. It seems to me that the thing that people should be afraid of at a 9-11 memorial is actually like radical Muslims killing people because it's a 9-11 memorial. Right? If we focus on what we have in common, individual decency, we're not focusing on structural inequalities that plague society. That's why the left thinks individual, uh, individualism as a philosophy is insufficient. Finally, they know that you're a bad person because you're the thought criminal. We've done means, we've done motive, and then there's opportunity. And the opportunity is you have the opportunity to be the bad guy. The only way you can be a bad guy in America, according to the left, is if you are a beneficiary of privilege. And this one you hear all the time, right? You're a beneficiary of privilege that you cannot escape. You are born into a system that benefits white, heterosexual, cisgender men. If you're a white man, you must be taken down a peg. It's the only way. You're guilty. Felons don't have rights. Neither do beneficiaries of white privilege. You were born into sin. You must pay. And if you don't pay, then we, you'll dominate. So we have to take you down, right? And if you dominate, you will destroy the equality of diversity. You hear this refrain constantly from folks on the left. Commentators on MSNBC have said, Mark Lamont Hill said this, 
that only white people are capable of racism. Only white people are capable of racism, which comes as a shock to black people since there was a recent poll that showed that black people think that black people are more racist than white people. Really, it was a Rasmussen poll a couple years ago. Okay, the fact is that anybody can be racist because all that means is you're making negative judgments about people based simply on the color of their skin. But MSNBC said only white people can be racist since only white people are privileged enough to be in a position of power and therefore only they can be racist. Right? Hillary Clinton, say people on the left, she can't be a perpetrator, she's by nature a victim since she is a woman. You know who's bad you are. By dint of birth, you must be deprived of your rights so that everyone can be equal. But here's the thing. In America, in a free country, everybody is born into some form of privilege. Everybody is born into one form of privilege or another. Americans, all of us, are born into the privilege of being born into the freest, most prosperous nation in the history of the planet. That doesn't mean that we ought to just allow six billion people to inundate the United States. Some of us are born with two parents. This is the best privilege, right? If you're born with two parents, that's the best privilege. And that has nothing to do with white privilege. Okay, the fact is that the poverty rate among single-parent white homes is 22%. The poverty rate among two-parent black homes is 7%. What happened to white privilege? Why aren't the white people who are single mothers doing better than the black people who have two parents in the home? Well, the answer is that the decision was the privilege. Right? The parents are the privilege, not the color. Some of us are born rich, some of us are born poor, some are born smart or tall or virtuous or handsome, and some of us are born Lena Dunham. Right? Some of us are just... <laughs> You know, we're all born with certain advantages. By the way, I mean, she was born with advantages, too. She was born into a super wealthy Upper, e uh, upper East Side Manhattan apartment. I mean, it's not. It, 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 she's born with certain advantages and certain disadvantages. Her disadvantage is that she likes to get naked on TV and she looks like a russet potato. You know, like, uh, the, the, there are advantages and disadvantages for everybody, but it's your job as a human being to do the best that you can with those advantages and disadvantages. Those cannot be equaled out. Those cannot be leveled out by any overarching government, because government isn't God. It can't fix those sorts of things. All we can do is ensure that everyone has equal rights that are protected, equal rights that are protected. In a free country, where we start off in life is not where we have to finish. And it isn't. In the United States, if you are in the bottom 20% of income earners in the United States, there is a 90% chance that within 15 years, you will be out of the bottom 20%. There's still tremendous income mobility in the United States. When people say there's the 1% and the 99%, it's total nonsense. The people in the 1% shift all the time. I've been in the 1%, I've been outside the 1%. Most people who have been in the 1% have spent many years outside the 1%. People who are young, everybody in this room, you're poorer than people who are 20 years older than you are. Right? They will be higher on the income ladder. Is that because they stole from you? Or is it because they're older and they've spent more time in the job market earning? Right? We do live in a free society. Don't believe the crap that you hear about how white privilege is keeping people down today. Historically speaking, of course there was such a thing as white privilege. Of course there was Jim Crow. Of course there was slavery. And of course there are people who are still living in the after effects of history. We don't start, the, the world didn't start spinning when we were born, right? I live in the aftermath of a history in which my people got slaughtered in Europe. Right? Everybody has a different history. And some of that history is pretty terrible. But you can't punish the great-grandchildren of the people who sinned because their great-grandfather sinned. That's injustice. That's not equal rights. That is violation of equal rights. And it is not white privilege to live in a society where you are all given equal rights and expected to do the best with the circumstances you are given when you are born. And by the way, the Black Lives Matter movement suggestion that the criminal justice system is biased against black people is utter and complete nonsense. It's just not true, statistically speaking. Police are less likely to kill blacks than whites in similar situations. There's a study from Harvard University, Roland Fryer, Professor Roland Fryer, who's a black guy, is front page of the New York Times like four months ago. There th he went through a thousand police shootings. He found that cops were less likely to shoot black people than white people in similar circumstances. In 2015, there were 987 shootings in the United States, police shootings of people in the United States. Something like 26% of the people who were shot and killed were black. Something like 50% of the people responsible for murder in the United States are young black males. Okay, so the idea that there's something wildly disproportionate going on where cops are just looking for black people to shoot, it's not true. It's just not true. And you know, as far as sentencing inequalities, people like to talk about crack cocaine versus powder cocaine. The idea that white people do, do powder and black people do crack, and therefore the different sentences are a reflection of racism. There's only one problem with that. Crack and powder are not the same thing. Crack is significantly more addictive. It is significantly more easy to distribute. And uh, not only that, the people who originally pushed for harsher sentences on crack cocaine were black legislators from the inner city who were sick of watching their communities ravaged by crack cocaine. If you actually want to look at two drugs that are, that are similar, you look at crystal meth, which is a white people drug, and crack cocaine, which is a black people drug in terms of arrest. 85% okay, of the people arrested for crystal meth are white. 
The sentences for an ounce of crystal meth and, the ounce, and an ounce of crack cocaine are exactly and precisely the same under federal law. So you're comparing apples and oranges when you compare the two different types of cocaine, but that's what everybody likes to do. In 1994, the DOJ did a survey of felony cases all around the United States, 75 locations all around the United States. They found black people were significantly less likely than white people to be prosecuted for felony offenses. Why? Because black communities are under-policed, not over-policed, as BLM would have you believe. If you kill the myth of privilege, it kills the left's ability to shut you down. They should be arguing about the merits of your argument, not about your identity. I, had a, I was interviewing with a, a woman from Esquire magazine today, and she could not get this through her head. She kept saying, why are all the Trump people so upset? I said, because you keep, you keep attacking them as bad people, as racists, without evidence. Okay, if you keep doing that, they're going to ignore your arguments. If you want to have a legit argument, we can have a legit argument, but the left's ideas all rest on the premise that you are a bad human being, and they know you're a bad human being because of your color or because of your income level, and that's a problem. So because you're a thought criminal, you have to be silenced. And they'll try and silence you by shouting white privilege or, microaggression, or microaggressions or pretending that you've invaded their safe spaces. Yesterday at University of Wisconsin, I spoke and a bunch of students uh, made a pretty big ruckus. You can check it out online. Uh, and, uh, and some of the students stood up and started chanting safety, to which I asked who farted. But they, but they started chanting safety. And, uh, and, and I, I asked them, I said, I don't understand. You're standing there chanting safety in a room full of these evil conservatives, many of whom supported Donald Trump, for the record, by the way, I didn't vote for either of the main candidates. Uh, and, uh, and they're standing there chanting. I said, do you feel unsafe? To me, you see, this is probably the safest place for you, right? I mean, you're here, you're shouting at us, you're disrupting our event, and nobody is doing anything to you. Nothing. But this is, the left has to imply that you are unsafe to them. They need a safe space, so shut up. The real safe space, I mean, it already exists on these campuses. I mean, really, their safe space... It, their, their imaginary safe space is, it exists. It's their basement where they have Bernie Sanders posters and weed. <laughs> they want control. They want control of society, of your life, of your ability to resist, of your will to resist. And in return for that control, they will tell you a lie, that you will feel better about yourself. You will feel really good. And that feeling lasts as long as you don't achieve anything. It lasts not very long at all. It turns out that achievement is the only path to really feeling good about yourself. That's what we have to fight, and that's where you folks come in. You're not thought criminals, and that's because you believe in, this is kind of cheesy, but the Superman trifecta. You do believe in truth and justice in the American way, and those are the only things that are worth fighting for. You know, when it comes to truth, truth only exists in the realm of facts. It doesn't exist in the realm of the feelings. When people on the left cite things that are not true, and then you say, that's not true, and they say, you're denying my truth, your truth is a lie if it does not comply with the truth. There's no such thing as your truth. There is just your opinion or your feelings. And I can't get inside your head. I can't be you, thank God. I can't do that, right? I can't, get, I can't have your feelings. I can't be privy to your truth. But here's the thing. You don't get to make up your own truth in the public square and then claim that everybody else has to comply with your truth. Second, it's your job to press for justice, right? America's breaking down into tribes, and this really is scary because it's happening both left and right. President Obama broke us up according to sort of racial tribes to exploit that tribalism for votes. Right? And he drove those tribes out to vote very, very strongly in 2012, and now you've seen on the right people have done that with other tribes. When I say tribalism, I just mean people voting according to, uh, according to a feeling of racial solidarity. It doesn't matter what the race is. Right? When the left speaks about social justice, this is another form of tribalism. Right? Social justice is the idea that individualism individual justice has to be trumped in the name of the group. Right? So, for example, in Ferguson, Missouri, Officer Darren Wilson shoots Michael Brown, right? justifiably, by all available evidence. The right answer there is, he did it justifiably, he shouldn't go to jail. The way the left viewed that was, he's a white officer, Michael Brown was a black guy, therefore he should go to jail. Social justice is injustice. Social justice is not just. Social justice is corrupt. It is anytime, justice doesn't need an, an, an amendment. It doesn't need an addendum. Anytime you add a word to justice, all you're doing is corrupting the word itself. We're not members of groups. We're individuals responsible for our own actions. And finally, you should stand up for Americanism. You know, freedom amounts. What freedom in the end really is, it's the idea of God-given rights protected by a government based on the consent of a moral and religious people. Leftists believe that freedom amounts to government-given rights. That's what leftists believe, that government gives you rights. Conservatives believe that government power is an obstacle to your rights. Leftists, power, leftists believe your rights are an obstacle to government power. Leftists offer Americans a seductive, 
un-American promise. All your problems will be solved if you just hand us all power and you will feel so much better about yourself. That's what politicians on the left say. It's what some politicians on the right say. Politicians are constantly telling you if you just give them more power, they will make you feel good. They'll fix all of your problems. They're not going to solve your problems. This is America. Solve your own problems. You are free. That's the wonderful thing about this country. That makes things hard because you are expected to be free. You're expected to solve your own problems. And guess what? Nobody cares enough about you in America to stop you. Really, the, the idea that there are people who are scheming somewhere to stop you and groups of people just like you, that they're sitting around thinking, how do I stop LGBTQ people? How do I stop gay people? How do I stop black people? How do I stop Jews? How do I stop women? Nobody's doing that. No one cares. You as an individual, it's your job to go out in the real world and succeed. And that doesn't mean anybody is obligated to give you a hand up, although many people are happy to do that. What it does mean is that everyone is obligated not to get in your way. People are obligated not to hurt you. If we can agree on that, then we can agree on America, and we can agree, we'll actually have a social fabric that's worth fighting for. We'll actually have a common cause that we can, that we can fight for. Decency, right? being a good person, making decisions that help you and help your family and help your society and make you better at what you do. That's what we should all be striving for, not this victim mentality that suggests that some people have to shut up because other people feel bad. So long as we are living in the world of feelings, we can't, down to the world, we can't get down to the world of facts. And here's the root fact that makes America so great. You are free to be your own person and to do the best that you can for yourselves, for your family, for your children, and for your country. Now, Ronald Reagan said that freedom is always one generation away from extinction. But freedom is always one generation away from revitalization. We can be that generation if we believe in the individual, if we shut down the social justice warriors, if we stop the nonsense about how freedom should take a secondary place to feelings. We can all fight for that together. We should all fight for individual justice and, 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 and objective truth. If we don't do that, we're not fighting for anything beyond our own destruction. Thanks so much. Happy to take questions. <laughs>